Yeah. Okay. Uh, my apologies for that. I'm not sure exactly ha what all happened. But anyhow, we're getting back to the idea. And, and this may be uh, the recording, I think, was interrupted as part of this. So we'll see what I can piece together at the end of it. Actually, uh, it still says it's recording consistently. So yeah, um, I just turned it back on. But um, oh, I see. Okay. You know, as far as what's being saved here on my computer, who knows? So we will see. Let me just in case we don't get it all back. Uh, let me just say again, this is the San Diego Fine Woodworkers Association CNC SIG for Saturday, October the 17th. And we are talking today about adding tools to your tool databases in Carbide Create and in VCAR. And then we're going to also talk a little bit about a, a file that Vectric has made available to us, which is uh, uh, something that we can use to, uh, it'll have some more graphics and things in it. So with that, let me go ahead and bring up, see if I can do uh, screen sharing a little bit better this time. And let's go to Carbide Create. And I think that, I think I know where my problem is. And that, that is that I'm in full screen on my laptop and Carbide Create opened up behind it. Oh. Okay, here we go. Let's get it over here. Okay, tell me if you're seeing Carbide Create. Unless you look identical to Carbide Create now. <laughs> oh, there How it goes. about now? <laughs> yes. Okay, very good. And uh, what happens, can you see the uh, menu when I'm selecting it now? You cannot see it, no. can you? No. Okay, um, let me see if I can um, share. So um, let me just suggest if you've already opened up the tool library, when you choose share, look amongst the windows that show up and see if you can find just that tool library. Uh, well, it, of course. Oh, now menu. you've done everything. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So this should do, now you should be able to see my menu, hopefully. Can you see the edit, edit menu? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so getting back to my original story, when I first got Carbide Create, I, found, I saw this where it said show tool database, and I selected that, and I saw this button that said new library, and I started trying to add a new library and to add tools right there, and it wasn't allowing me to do it. And so I went to the uh, community.carbide.com, and um, I put the question out there and I found out that there was actually up here this, uh, if you go into, let me, let me get, dismiss this for a moment. If you go into about carbide create and open data dictionary, you get to this location and under the tools file folder, you can see these uh, CSV file, files and those contain the descriptions of the tools. Well, that's what you know, what I had created there is what disappeared this morning when I started uh, trying to show how to do this. And so um, I went back to community.carbide.com and I found out that now uh, they have actually, this is working. So what, when you go into uh, show the tool database and now you right click on, uh, well, you click on new library here, you can create a new library. And let's just create one just as a, experiment here. You have to specify the material because if you set up your tools for hardwood or something, that doesn't mean that they're going to work on aluminum. In fact, probably not. And so you choose the material that you're going to use. And uh, let's say, for instance, we wanted to create one for polycarbonate. Uh, and then we, you choose the machine you're using. And then you give it a library name. Now it's going to add the uh, machine name and the material name to your uh, database when it creates it. So if you name it something like Spectra Shapeoka Hardwood, it's going to add Shapeoka Hardwood again. And so, you know, I'm, a, I'm the uh, chairman of the Department of uh, Redundancy Office. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I get everything two or three times here. So you might want to keep that in mind when you name it. So you can just, let's just call this uh, sample Poly carb, and you create, you click OK. And then what happens is, and uh, oh, I somehow I got to all. Let's go to polycarbonate. 
And you'll notice you have now the uh, each of these groups of uh, where you can add specific tools, and they are empty at this time. So what you would do is you would right click on one of them, and you would add. You'd say add tool, and you whatever kind of tool it is you want to define, and whether or not that tool is inch or millimeters. Uh, hopefully, you're all still seeing what I'm talking about here. Yes. Okay, so let's go to inch. And then that brings up this dialog. And in this dialog, you would uh, start to give some of the information about the tool names. And that is where I, I took information from this card that came with the mills that I had uh, purchased and I was able to start adding them to the database. Now, let's go back to the hardwood. Okay. Well, it's not letting me click. Probably ought to click okay. On the, sub, on the screen below. What screen below? Uh, the one where you had the form to fill out, where you were creating that one tool. Oh, that's currently that behind window your... showing up on, there it is, right there. There, yeah. I'd covered the window. Okay, so let's cancel that. And let's go back, thank you. Uh, my tech support team here. So I've been doing software for a while and lots of times when, um, software developers come up with ways where th their databases are incompatible. What they generally do is you export your data, upload the, you know, upgrade the software and then import right. um, that stuff. And that wasn't provided for. Not that I'm, a, not that I've been able to find. Also, another way you can do it is when you start up the new version of the software, if it comes up and says, hey, we found these databases, would you like to import them? That would be a, a way to handle it as well. Right. Seeing that. Yeah. Well, they have that import capability. Now, yeah. what I, what I have found that we, that I could do, Doug, was um, after I created the database and it created the CSV file, according to the name that I had defined here uh, with all the redundancy in it. Um, I was able to go open up that CSV file and copy and paste the information from the previous C CSV file into it. And then it, then you quit the program and open the program again and voila, they're all there. So since I discovered all of this, Travis, uh, early this morning while I was getting ready for this meeting, uh, I haven't had a chance to do a lot of experimenting with it, but the, uh, the way you add tools changed while I was uh, preparing for this meeting. So that's why I'm, I'm really not all that uh, well uh, versed on how to do this. But let's go ahead and open up one of these tools and get that dialogue back there uh, or edit tool. And you see here, you can put in the, the, uh, the name of the tool, the model of the tool, the vendor, the tool number. Now, when you put in the tool number, that is the number that is going to show up when you're running a, uh, a tool through your uh, Shapeoko. At, when you're running a job through your Shapeoko and it says you, it's time for a tool change, it will come up and say, for instance, you need to insert tool 46201. So originally, I had made, just made up some numbers. I started all my, um, all of these Spectre tools with the um, number nine, just to separate them out from the carbide tools. And I uh, uh, made up just sequential numbers for them. And the problem with that is uh, I had no reference, no cross-reference when it came up in Carbide Motion and said, you know, switch to tool 920. Uh, so what is tool 920? So with this, using this number, I was able then to reference back to the card that tells me which tool does what. And I was able to, to go ahead and do it. So we have the tool diameter. We have the plunge rate, the feed rate, the RPMs, depth. Uh, finish allowance, feed rate, and step over. Now, in the, uh, a lot of this information, this information was either inferred from the specifications that was on that data card that I showed you of the tools, or it was um, copied from other similar tools in the Carbide 3D uh, tool database. So, and, and this, this becomes the, a starting point and you start experimenting with the tool. And if the tool seems to be overloaded, 
then what you need to do is you need to start adjusting some of these. Or if you're, if you go into a job and the tool's working like a champion and you go into the um, over, uh, you know, th there's the, the button that allows you to increase the feed rate and you go, you can go up as high as 200% on the feed rate. And if it's still working great and you're not having any challenges, then you could go back and you could edit these to a little bit faster and a little bit deeper and uh, give you more control over the job. So that's how I wound up adding all of these different uh, tools in. And then once you've done that, you can go in and you can say, uh, for instance, to for this library to duplicate this library. And then you can, once you've duplicated it, you can edit it to another material um, or a, um, uh, well, you, that would be the big advantage, I think, is to be able to take all your settings and um, transport them to another material and then uh, edit them further from there if you need to slow things down or speed things up based on the material. Any questions about that? Yeah, I, I do have a question. This whole software that you're showing, is that strictly for like the Shapoko? Well, so this software is written by Carbide 3D and it is free software and it works on uh, for sure the Shapoko and the Nomad. And I think it would probably work in conjunction with the machine controller software, which is the Carbide Motion here. It would probably work on a lot of different CNC machines. But you can and use VCarve and all that on your Shapoko as well, correct? Yes, you can. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Howard, just, yeah. just so you know, they put they stick pretty close to just plain G code that is produced out of this thing. Yes. So any specific spindle control, for instance, or any specific setup controls for your CNC, this would not create. But if you have a standard block that you use for setting up your machine or setting, uh, winding down your machine at the end of the G code, uh, and you wanted to add it, this is generic G code producing. So from the perspective of free, fairly potent, and really doing about 95% of what you want to do in the real world of CNC. And I would add to that would, a lower learning curve. And a lower learning curve. Uh, this is a great way to produce the G code, but it is generic in the sense that it doesn't deal specifically with, if you go back to VCAR, for instance, and you're in the tool path saving area and you click on, uh, I'm going to grab the screen here for just a second. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. So I'm going to just share my VCAR real quickly here. In fact, uh, Travis, the next thing I was going to ask was for somebody who would like to show how to do this on VCAR, because since I had to learn how to do it a new way this morning on Carbide Create, I'm not prepared to show that. Yeah, that's cool. So I just wanted to first make a point to Howard, uh, Howard that when you're saving a tool path and you click on this, you will see this drop down box. And we don't mess with it in the shop because we always use saving in Shapoko inches. Mine says with tool change just because I have the tool changer set up. We are not but seeing I, a drop down box. I haven't opened it yet. So here's the drop down box. Mm. And if you are seeing what I think you're seeing, yes. then you'll see that there's this huge list, just incredible number of CNCs that are supported by VCARV. And that's because they have received the setup codes and other <clears throat> small idiosyncrasies that these different brands will have. And like for instance, a one size machine will have a different size bed than another size machine. And they'll have different codes for initializing the spindle and things like that. And so I'm only making a contrast here, Howard, between what people can get for free, learn easily and produce generic G code with, or code that's specific to Shapeoko, which is pretty generic, and the Carbide um, Nomad, which is a little less generic, you can do all of that with Carbide Create. Then that's in contrast to this vast number of CNCs that are supported inside of Carbide, uh, excuse me, instead of VCarve. A lot of brands come out in this conversation. Just try it up. <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around this is G code has been around since like 1950. Yeah, it's forever. Um, it's pretty 
um, robust and well implemented. Um, wondering if it's not really specific, you know, out of the ordinary G code that's in these different it's machine not. settings. It's, it's not. really things where there are variables um, or certain uh, bed size available options. Yeah, but also um, different parameters to different because there are like uh, codes that can trigger a certain part of your controller. And one machine might use, you know, S250 for a certain fan speed or blower or motor or pump or whatever. And another machine would use a different one. So those configurations are probably more standard G code, just unique configuration files. It is machine. exactly it is exactly what you're saying, Doug. People have at various times over the course of the past 20 years, because of the limitations of G code, they've tried to extend the language, but it's so deeply set as a simple standard that's universally supported that so far, I mean, like Smoothie, for instance, came along and tried to do certain things that were extending it. And there were other folks who were trying to take it different places. It never went anywhere because it's so broadly accepted. It's a really rudimentary language. It is what you said, Doug. It's taking the old G code and for any given machine, there are features that are implemented or not implemented and there are parameters that are set or not set. And that's and so all that, say that again, Howard? I said that's all done and taken care of when you make the post processor for each of the different machines. Bingo. That's why some, what's your machine again, Howard? Remind me. Oh, the uh, CNC router parts desktop pro. Right. So uh, that's now Avid, right? Avid now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've got an Avid machine and what Avid did was they supplied Vectric with the preprocessor and post-processor add-ons that need to be tacked on to generic G code for their particular machines. Those get tested by Vectric. And then if everything goes well, they are added into the drop-down list. Carbide Create doesn't have nearly that, but you could add your own G code blocks in the beginning and end if you wanted to use Carbide Create to create the G code and then wanted to have it be working on the Avid machine, for instance, that Howard has. So that's how those things get in that drop-down list from Vectric is that the CNC producers create the post processors, which then are provided to Vectric and they're added into the software. And so sounds, uh, sounds in like the one case you have Carbide 3D who has a business of selling Shapeokos and selling Nomads. And so they provide basically the post processors for those two, but produce generic G code. Vectric is an all software company. So they want to support as many CNCs as possible. So if you have a credible CNC in the marketplace and you provide them with a post processor that you can show them will work, they will include it in VCarve and Aspire and all the others. Okay. Thank you much, much for that, uh, Travis. And sure. what I'd like to do now is, is ask if there's anybody who would like to take a moment to show us how you would add tools into VCarve. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, great. Howard, when you do that, could you do us also a favor? Because when we look at the tool library that comes with Carbide Create, we get a certain set of tools with a certain set of speeds and feeds associated with those. And they acknowledge right off the bat that they have a very, they have a, a one horsepower, 1 1.25 horsepower spindle that they use, and they have a much weaker one for the, the Nomad. And so their speeds and feeds are adjusted accordingly. Yours, Howard, is a monster. And I'm just curious, do you take the default numbers that are provided when you get a quarter inch flat end mill and it is, the, the company says, this is the speed and feed, 150 inches per minute and such and such. Do you go with the numbers they give you? To start with. And okay, then good. And, then and it just will... so Howard, I would not recommend that in the case of the Shapeoko because it is not nearly the powerful spindle yeah. that you have. And so I just wanted to introduce that thought into this conversation that when you end up with machines that are at the lower end of the spectrum, 
the numbers you get for these end mills that Howard would use as a starting point are probably much more rigorous and much more aggressive than what we could use on, say, a Shapeoko that just uses a Makita trim router for a spindle. Okay, I just wanted to get people aware of that that difference because you, Howard, can start with the numbers that are given to you. Yeah, and like I say, they're usually slow, and but I mean they work. So unless you need to speed it up, like it's a eight hour job that you might get down to six hours, you know, yeah, you're going to change the feeds and speeds and go from there. But it, it's a great starting point. Okay, go ahead. Take it away, Howard. Okay. Uh, let me see. I got to do my screen thing here. How do I do that? Uh, Don't ask me. Share. Your screen share. Okay. Where are we at here? Yeah, if you see an option that says desktop, I think that works best, but we'll, we'll see here. Okay, are you, are you we seeing? See just we are, Howard. Looking good. We're good. Yes, sir. Okay. So, like, I, you know, you were talking about a man of bits. You don't have to download them all individually. If you go to the uh, MANA website, they have all their bits in a file. And this can all be uploaded into the tool database um, right from their site and it makes it quite simple and then you know like I have a lot of the tapered ball nose well, I have like three of these here so you know I don't have to go do anything on those they're already defined and so on so it just makes it a lot simpler than trying to add each and every one of them and same way with like uh, you've seen my group of uh, router bits that I have, and a lot of them are large from uh, my legacy ornamental mill. Well, I was able to download all those so that, you know, I could do my, uh, like this shape right here. You know, you can do all these different shapes and you can, you can actually program these in manually, uh, you know, and get them. But if you just download them from the company, it just makes it easier. So almost all these companies that sell these bits, they have the tools available for you to upload into Aspire, VCarve, and so on. Hey, Howard, uh, are the bits for your ornamental mill still being produced? Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, magnet, not magnet, magnet or magnet, or magnate. Uh, magnate, that's, yeah. That's the company. And yeah, because uh, now they like I'm able to use them all on the CNC machine. So uh, you know, um, Legacy they've got their uh, CNC machine now, which is using all these large bits. So let's say you wanted to do a picture frame and you wanted this detail right here. Well, if you were trying to do that in a 3D, it would take you hours. But if you throw yeah. in this bit right here, I can go around the 18 by 24 frame in probably a minute and a half. Wow. You know, and so you get all this detail with this, you know, uh, profile bit and it just like, it's a no brainer. And you add a couple different profile bits and you can get a pretty elaborate design going, uh, you know, that will, you know, make whatever you want to make. So, but I don't know if everybody's familiar, but if you see over here where it says online, is everybody see that right there? Yep. Yes. Uh, once you sign in uh, to uh, Vetric, you can upload your tool database. So like I have a couple different computers that I work on. I work on one up in my office. Uh, I work one up in my actual physical office up in Kearney Mesa. And I got one down by the CNC machine. Well, I want those all to have the same tool database. So when I have my database all where I want it, you can upload it to Vetric. And then when you're down in that other machine, now you can go in the Vetric and download that tool database. And that way all your tool databases will match across all your different machines, which is really helpful. Uh, be very careful, because if you're playing on a, like uh, something that ain't your go-to machine, and you're messing around and everything, 
and suddenly you upload that. <laughs> when you go on your other machine and you download it, you're going you're to be downloading the wrong database. So you got to be real careful when you're uploading and downloading that you know that you've got the good database up there to start with. But like I've had a situation where my tool database did get corrupted. I was able to log in, go up, download it, and I was back in business in a matter of minutes. So, it, you know, it really does help. But, um, you know, adding a bit, you know, you can, you know, come down here, you can add a group, you can copy a selected group, you can uh, click here to add a tool under a selected group, and then, you know, it gives you all the different options. And let me just, if I click that, uh, it's it's going to let me, because I'm in this group right here, it's going to add like, it wants to add a ball nose, but maybe I don't want to add a ball nose, I want to add an end mill. So now I can be adding an end mill, or maybe I've got a uh, form tool. Oop. Maybe uh, like a tapered ball nose. So, you know, it gives me kind of like what this looks like. I can get the diameter, the side angle, the tip radius, and you're getting all this if you're entering it manually, uh, right from the manufacturer. And once you have it all in there, I can you can change the name up here, what it uh, looks like. If you click on that, and you can see these are variables. It's taking the tool type, the angle, and all that. And but you can change all that. You don't have to use theirs. You can come in and uh, make your own, add your own um, parameters up there so that all your tool bases will come out looking the same, like the degrees, the tip, the quarter inch, and so on. But you can, like I say, you can go in here and change all that, and you can just say uh, my bit, just for an example. And now it just says my bit. Well, that doesn't do any good, but I mean, but you have the choice of modifying that and putting in anything you want. And I don't want to set that as the tall, I probably just did, <laughs> but I'll change it. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so if you have a, a way you want to label all your bits, uh, you can do that and you have control over that. And so I'll just say cancel that. Uh, let's go back over here to tool, band, tool database. And you've got, you know, in Vetric, you can do it by machine or you can do, and also by material, just like you were doing in the other one. Yeah, if you got hardwoods, you can set up all your tools just for hardwoods. If you're doing MDF, you can set up your tools for MDF. So that when you go to bring in an end mill and you're doing oak, you're going to bring in the hardwood. Uh, M, uh, quarter inch end mill. If you're doing MDF, you bring that one in. So, so are the mills actually different for the different woods? I thought they were just speeds and feeds, and that. No, I, no, and I, no. It's the same bit, but it, you, it's the feeds and speeds. And okay. so, that if you go to the material, all the bits that you set up for the material, uh, you can have the correct feeds and speeds for those, <coughs> and all the bits you set up for like uh, a different type of wood, you can, you know, it, it can be under the wood. I mean, under the yeah. type of wood that you're using. Is that, is that, am I making any sense there? Yes. In other words, it's the same quarter inch end mill, but it's going to have different characteristics, whether you're doing aluminum, whether you're doing oak, yeah. or whether you're doing maple, rock right. maple. It, it, it's it's so, applied it's applied differently. It's the same right. end mill, but it's applied differently. Right, because you don't want to go into your job and have to change the parameters every single time. So you change it once for that particular type of wood, and then you got it there, and it just makes it easier to get around your tool database. But I find it just so incredibly useful that you can download all these things and at least get a starting point. And whether your machine is overpowered, underpower, you'll know, and you can just take what they're giving you, and if under normal circumstances, you've got to drop everything down 30%, then you just do it across the board, and you should be good. 
Um, so you don't have all those bits. Is there no. a way to like to like disable those? You can hide them because when you when it's time for you to find your bit, um, <laughs> it's right. like you spend twenty minutes just. You looking don't want for it to be a needle list. in a haystack. Well, like all these, yeah, all these right here are my bits. And these down here, I have all these because these are those. Those are the ones that you added, right? Right. Yeah. So not like ones you imported, like as a sales list or something. Well, right. I, but how no, I, I did import these because they were part of that magnet group of uh, bits from that company. So I was able to import all of those. But Howard, can you go to one that is the Amana, for instance? And I believe, and I may be confusing what you can do in Carbide Create with what you can do in Vcarb, but I think you can hide them. So if, if you don't own it, you can oh, hide. Oh no no yeah I can I can delete these. Uh, let's say uh, we'll just take this one right here, spiral aluminum. I don't need that. Let's say I just come down here and hit removing this tool. Or the, are you sure you want to delete it? Yes. So I just deleted that one. So you now know your next project though is going to use aluminum. <laughs> oh yeah, but now see, I, I, I'm going to find a great sale on it. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's, okay, let's, let's say we have this one right here that we just bought, but we don't want to have this whole list. You can come down here, copy to select right. the tool group, add a group, uh, add a tool, and then you can copy that. Let me, uh, so I think that would be the thing. Wait, wait, do that like again. You saw hide. That would, you do a right click again hide. on it. I know. Okay, we got that. Do a right click. Hide unused tools. Ah. That's what I'm talking about, Doug. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Or hide okay, group. Cool. Because yeah, de deleting it, you've got a database with all these things. If yeah. you go and buy that, you know, bit, then you'd go, oh, it's not in my list. I got to exactly. now re-download the whole thing. But hiding it, you can. So perfect. That yeah. makes sense. Just looking at that list, though, would just go, oh, my God, where is my bit by bit? Right. So right. just like he just said right there, here's a whole group. Hide unused, hide groups. Unset tools, whatever that means. Yeah. Well, you can always do that, too. But it okay. didn't seem like it hid that group, though. Had hide group. Yeah, it ain't letting me well, do Well, I think, sure, if you have, like, Howard, I, your whole notion of list. copying. I'm sorry, Doug, I spoke over you. Go ahead. No. Nope. But I let's say the ball nose. That. Let's say I just got this particular ball nose. I just come down here. Oh, nah, I didn't want to do that. Copy, copy selected tool or group. So I'm going to copy that tool. Yeah. Okay. And then copy settings, copy. And then I can then I can move. See, it's got two of them. Then you can click and hold, and I can move that around. So if I wanted to move it up to Howard's. I, I don't think you sa saved it yet, but okay. Well, that's, Okay. He's going to get his uh, tool database so messed up here he won't ever really find anything. <laughs> hey, but he can oh, download, download a fresh copy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to download, yeah, after this, right. I'm downloading a fresh copy is for sure. <laughs> okay, so there's ways to manage yeah. all that and uh, make it more easily usable um, instead of having, you know, 3,000 bits pop in your face. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is a pro tool. He's even got a spire. I mean, it, this is the this is top end stuff here. So okay. The question is, if you have you do a machine at home, or you yeah. do a project at home, based upon your CNC, and then you take that project, say your machine breaks, and you take that project to the shop bring in the feeds and speeds, but your spindle is a lot less capable, less robust than your spindle at home. Uh, you're still going to have to wash the program through the shape local program at the shop for a, 
a lower uh, a reduced ability spindle because you can't use the feeds and speeds. Right. No, right. you'd have to you'd have to bring over the file into like VCarve or whatever you got at the shop, and then you're going to use the tool database you got on the one at the shop. Okay. Exactly, and, and it's going to have already the tools with lower amounts. So if I was using a quarter inch end mill on my machine and running it at 300 feet a minute and I go to take that same file into VCarve at the shop, run it on a Shapoko, and I pull up the quarter inch end mill there, it's gonna be showing maybe 100 you know, inches a minute or whatever it happens to be. Wash it through and for the abilities of the machine that you're gonna run the project on. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Howard. I appreciate you stepping in and doing that. I, um, uh, wouldn't have been able to show nearly that kind of functionality. So thank you for that. But the, and the biggest thing to come away with that is that you can upload it to Vetrix and download it. Yeah, that's very useful. That'll save your butt when you wake up one morning, like you say, and you lose your tool database. That could be a <laughs> hell of a lot of work if you have all your feeds and speeds all, you know, yes. done for you. you yes, it. I, it did turn out that I was able to copy and paste it into the new file. So I didn't yeah. completely lose it, but uh, had a, a moment of panic there, uh, surely. Now, Travis, if you could take a moment and tell us a little bit about the uh, file that Vetric has provided for us to be able to access with the library of graphics. And yeah, you bet. You bet. What I'd like to do really is we have this moment in time when we're all stuck and we can't do a ton of things outside of the home. These videos are all well and good, but what else is there out there? Um, recently, Vectric had to stop their worldwide user group meeting in San Diego. Many of you actually signed up to go to it and uh, they held it virtually. Now, the first thing I want you guys to know about is the fact that this complete Vectric user group, and hopefully you are seeing my screen. Yes, we are. It's all online. You can watch every single presentation and it's free. There were three days worth of presentations. These are examples of the different presentations that were given. I'll go ahead and show you day two, day three. It's full of really interesting things. And accompanying that, they offered this bit of software, which I'm gonna go through real briefly, but as a way to show you that software, I'm gonna give you an overview from this page where they describe the contents. So in this $49 package, which accompanies a lot of those presentations, so when you watch the presentations, if you were just watching, you couldn't do anything about it. But if you were watching and you had these files, you'd be able to do things with those files and learn what they're talking about. Some of these things are techniques. Some of these things are what other people are doing in terms of interesting projects. Some of these things are actually new features. So that's the kind of thing you tend to get at the user group. And that's what we have here. So here, we have a whole bunch of clip art, which typically we, with our Makerspace edition, don't get, but this clip art, we can load into our software. I'll show you what some of that looks like. Uh, it usually comes in various forms. So we have this snake pattern here, and it's in here in a bowl shape, but you can also get it freestanding, and there's a third version that it's given. So they have lots of different, and I say lots, I really mean more like, Oh, 18 or 24, so there are 18 pieces all together that they're providing. And it accompanies one of the presentations. There's something called gadgets. Gadgets is kind of like macros. Macros that are programmable with a special UI and you can put uh, code behind it. This presentation is more technical than most anybody here would want to see except for maybe Doug. And <laughs> yet it does sort of remind us of what these gadgets can do and in watching just the beginning of this presentation you're reminded of the kinds of things that are available becky who's probably all of our favorite uh video presenters within vectric just as part of one of her presentations provided a bunch of 2d vector no big deal here it just happens to accompany some of the things she does and so for instance she has this one presentation that is if you're in the business of making signs, 
and you have a few signs that people like a lot, like for instance, the birth of a baby, and you know that there are just a few variables you need to change, how do you design your files so that you can instantly customize them and pump them out with very little effort? And so it's uh, an efficiency talk, and she uses some of this, these vectors in that talk. Down here we have some project files. These two, as most of us already use a laser, not that big a deal. They're just slotted projects and it shows you how to do them. Uh, this gorilla model though is interesting because it takes a 3D model, it slices it, and then it lays it out so you can make one of these things. That was interesting. Um, there's a feature in Aspire that allows you to do some special things with molding. I'd say probably 20% of what we would have seen in the presentations is not available to us because there are features that have to do with 3D and Aspire only. There's a certain file for format called CRV 3D, which vCarve won't uh, read. And so there's about 20% of this stuff that is kind of useless to all of us except for Howard. Um, this was interesting in that they had a, I'd say it was a, a minor theme of something that Ed has been talking to us about, which is using a laser on our CNCs. And there are some specific presentations on this, and they're pretty interesting. Also, using the vCarving feature that is now a part of the vCarve and Aspire software, so you can go from photos to using vBits and mapping from different darknesses to different depths of the V-bit to create picture images on wood. Uh, you'd see it when you watch this, and hopefully that description was enough to give you a rough understanding. Oh, let's see. Uh, this one was very interesting to me. I actually put this one on the forums. This is where it is, again, a hybrid of a CNC and laser project, but I think it was on our last Zoom meeting where we talked about the hypothetical of a CNC being able to raise and lower when it was using its laser, so the laser always stayed in focus, okay? So as you went over a contour, the laser would be lifted and lowered by the CNC head so that it maintained a constant distance to the surface of what you're uh, laser cutting or etching. And so you always ended up with an in-focus beam. Uh, that's, that's a really great one. I really enjoyed that. And uh, this is where Becky talks about those custom signs. And she has some templates. She provi provided all that clip art. And you just learn how to really produce things if you're in the business of that. Then they had some partners come along. And a couple of these are not useful to most of us because we don't have Aspire and they're 3D projects. But Randy had a very interesting one. And uh, I think I'll show you that. And then this guy from Rainbow Rainfall Projects, he did some crazy things like this giant sword and he used a plasma cutter along with um, uh, his CNCing of plastic and wood to create something amazing. He did this large bowl, five feet in diameter, okay? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember, oh, the Hurley, that's a type of, I guess it's a sport in Scotland or something like that. It looks like a dangerous weapon to me. Uh, but I wanted to just show you what was in that bundle. And then I, now I'd like to just take you on a quick tour of a few things. We happen to be down here. So let's don't see this don't large forget to take time to show us where to find this also. Oh, I'm gonna be dropping that so here we go, listen to these uh, three projects. We're not hearing them. Oh, you're not hearing anything? That's okay, just watch. You'll hear it. He's just gonna show you vis visuals in just a second here. Okay. There's the bowl. <laughs> There's the Hurleys. Look at the 3D um, the 3D lettering on the side. And then there's a third project, which is the sword. Oh, let me go back. There's that sword. There. 
look at this thing. He, he had a plastic insert here. He used a, a new a tool path called a fluting tool path. Uh, this is a chrome exterior, plastic interior, and then he uses a plasma cutter to produce this and then to put the patina on it afterwards. Um, it just, just, you get some insights from this guy's video, which are just kind of fun. And so those three projects at the bottom here are those things. Let me see if I can show you Randy's, um, uh, like, actually, I'm going to show you that in VCarve. Uh, going back one more time. Uh, that let's let's switch over right now, so I can just show you some of the things in the file. So if you look into our chat, uh, I will have put in there. Where is it? I will put in there now. Um, where you can see all these videos. Okay, so that's the first link. I want to give you another link, which is where you can download the bundle of resources. And that's this. And all those videos are on YouTube as well. They downloaded them all. Yeah, they, they were very generous with uh, the content from this particular user group. Let me go ahead now and share with you what's in that file. Um, let me just ask Howard a question though. Howard, you shared your whole desktop. What was it that you clicked on to share your whole desktop? Uh, well, I didn't know I did. But well, the first was... window that came up when I shared mine, Travis, said desktop. Oh, did it? Okay, because yeah. I'd like to show my desktop, but I don't see one that says desktop. Okay, so I'm going to do it a different way, which is I'm going to just show you the list of uh, files that are in. This is, the, this is the file set, the folders that are there, and I'm just going to be running down and showing you a few things real briefly so you can get a sense of what's in there. Let me go back now and... Stop sharing and then share vCarve. vCarve. Okay, so one of the resources that's there is a uh, that Gorilla project where it was a 3D model and then they applied slicing and then they laid those slices out. And so this is how you could build up a 3D model from just 2D stock, like we do with the laser, but without the burn here. And you get the indexing and the positioning from all these peg holes so that one layer goes on top of another. Uh, when you run it, this is what you'd end up with. And it's just an interesting technique where you can take 3D models and unlike what you could get with a laser, here <coughs> we have the contour from one layer to the next, right? We're not, we're not losing the definition. A laser, we're gonna go straight through. Here, we can add the contouring. And so you end up with then, here you can see in the eyes, you can see that we're actually keeping the detail. And I don't have a picture of the assembled one, uh, but that was cool. I also noticed it was kind of cool. They've added this feature inside of, um, inside of VCarve. You used to see right through, it used to be blank. If you set your depth of cut equal to the thickness of the material, now they show you this onion skin where you can actually see that you are going through and there's a little bit of material left. That was a silly side uh, nuance, but I found that to be kind of interesting. Let's go and see something else that was in that um, bundle. So now how is that differentiated? Because if I'm looking at that, I think those are the, um, the tabs. They are. Um, but if I were to look at that, Knowing what I know now, I would say I am not going completely through. Agreed. Agreed. And now this, you see the blue right here? You see how you can see little bits and pieces through there? Yes. That, that's the clue. That's the silly little nuance that I picked up on that I just was intrigued by because carbide create, when you cut the thickness of the material, it doesn't show you that you've gone through the material. It shows you material. VCarve, 
used to show that you'd gone through the material because it was blank. That is to say, there was no more wood. Now V-Carve has gone to where it shows you this onion skin with poke through points. So you actually see little bits of blue. So you know you've gone through the thickness of the material. But Sorry, this has nothing to do with my presentation. The nose shows all the way through. And it does show all the way through when you've gone a little <laughs> deeper, I guess, when you've done these peg holes. Right. Those things you do see all the way through, you're right. Yeah. So let me show you another something here. Yeah. I think that this one is just amazing because I am a new turner. And to think that this could be done on the CNC and you couldn't even do it when you were turning. Uh, let me ask whether or not you can see a bowl or whether you still see the gorilla. The gorilla. same gorilla. Okay, so I need to actually unshare and then share again. This is gonna be a bit of a back and forth ordeal here. Let's see here. Okay, so this is what I imported and hopefully you do see Vectric User Group 2020, Randy Johnson, right? Yeah. So this is a two-sided, um, object here and I am going to just show you what they did because I just want to run this thing. It's so much fun to watch being done. I'm going to preview all tool paths. Let me uh, do the top side here. Okay, preview all tool paths. Okay, so we're doing the bottom of the bowl and uh, to begin with, it really is just a roughing cut followed by a finishing cut, but the details that are added before it flips were pretty amazing. So right now, this is nothing special. This is what you to see in any roughing pass. Okay, now we get the instant presto, of course, with the uh, Finishing pass. I, I wish finishing passes places. went that quickly. Yeah, no kidding. What he does next is so cool. Look at that. Okay, now he's gonna flip the thing, or I guess I'm gonna flip the thing. And we're gonna do the other side. So now we're, now we're roughing out the interior. So this is the concave side. And again, nothing special here. But once we do this, we've got a finishing pass, no big deal. But now the textures that he adds. Look at that. And so if we take a look at this bowl, I mean, it's just really beautiful. And I just have not considered that. I don't even know what the, which of these tool pads here he's doing, what he's doing these tool pads because I didn't really break it down. But just doing that is so spectacular. Now it's a little unfortunate that he has the uh, tabs. I can just see where I'm gonna have a hard time getting rid of the tabs and not damaging the perimeter. But um, it sure is an amazing set of things that he's done in this. And again, the video takes you through the whole thing. I didn't watch this video. Uh, let me go back now. And do one more here. Where Let's lots see. of uh, software would have done those, that uh, design as more of a, like in, in the actual single plane type thing, it looks like this finished the whole thing and then did a three dimensional um, cut right across yeah along X, these y, flues here Z. yeah yeah i know I, I i didn't watch the video but this is the reason i'm showing you guys this is that it's available to watch the files are also available to us and it's something new we can try you know it's not as complicated yeah, they say that it's like a five degree of uh i did i didn't even see what cnc was uh, being used for this uh, let me take you to actually something else here. It was in the browser. It was so neat to see in action. This is where we would end up then. Uh, let me share the browser. It's not done on a lathe. It's done on a CNC. No, this is all CNC, yeah. yeah. Um, let me share again here. And this time I'll do my browser again. We're going back to that same screen that we were doing, but I want to click on his 
hybrid CNC laser files. And I've, I think I've got the video set up to right where I wanted to start. So here he's doing a smoothing pass on this uh, 3D carve. That guy right there, by the way, is the president of uh, Vectric. Okay, so now he's talking about how if you have the laser attached to it, now he says you can burn a picture over the surface of that. And he's about to do that. And I just want you to see, while we don't see the laser going up and down with the head keeping the beam in focus, you'll be able to see that uh, he's applying a picture on top of this. So here he goes. So he's that's burning over the difficult. surface and projecting. And so here you see, he's got a raster. The blue is lighter burn and the black is darker burn. And it was kept in focus as it went from say, the front of the lips at the low port to the top of the ear because V-Carve's G-code kept it at a constant distance from the wood. And so that's, uh, that's just pretty impressive to me. Yeah. And he just, he just changed the way. Of, right. How, Sorry, how Doug, go ahead. done, I would believe, is you, would, you have your laser attached to your Z-axis, your spindle. You just don't have a bit in there right and you then do a finish pass um the trick would be varying the spindle speed um based based on the the color depth that's the only tricky part about that would be varying because because that's how the lasers work our or tours they're essentially connected to the spindle. G yeah, well, that's where the uh, PWM signal off the um, uh, board you know, drives the, the laser. And But yeah, well, what uh, Travis yeah. is talking about is not only varying the PWM you know, laser speed, the, the spindle speed to, to drive the laser, but also going up and down on the Z-axis at the right time to get that focal length. So you keep the focus right. And yeah. that's what you're when you do a finish pass, uh, yeah. right, you get that. That's what your yeah. G code will do is, is give that whole contour. So you're kind of just throwing the laser on a finish pass with a spindle yeah. um, variation. Hey, Doug, it's I don't disagree. Cool. I mean, we, we could all sit and say, it seems pretty reasonable, but here they put it into a professional package in a standard workflow to make it easy for everybody. Yeah. And I, that's, that's the part that I was so excited about. Because, I mean, if you yeah. do CNC and you do laser, you say, this is A and that's B and A plus B should be quite doable. But now it's getting to the point where it's quite doable and easily doable. Yeah. And I thought that was just really right. kind of a fun thing and to see. And the uh, finished uh, product is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, there's so much more in here, but I'm gonna show you just one more thing here, which is, uh, let's say I, I mentioned the new baby. Uh, I'm talking about sound, sounds now. I'm talking about efficiency. But let me share. Um, let me share VCarve again here. And so when Becky talks in this video, she talks about just the use of layers and the idea of um, automatic text resizing. Uh, within a certain defined area. So let's say it was the 19th of July of 2020, but somebody comes along and they have it on the 22nd day of September, and you still need it to fit without rowing across here. You know, what technique do you, which of these tools do you use to do that? Uh, how can you easily get graphics to be properly sized and positioned in the right place? So maybe you want to put a heart here, maybe you want to put a star here. Uh, these these are all tips that she gives for people who are in the business, uh, a small sideline, maybe an Etsy store or something like that, of producing these things to custom demand. And, uh, you know, you end up with just beautiful results without having to rethink each time. And... Um,
you know, it's, it's, it's just, uh, if you're in the business because of an Etsy store and you want to be able to say, you can put your name in there and you can change the date and we can put a phrase up to 20 characters and change the art. She's got techniques for efficiency that she's talking about in that presentation. So I just want to encourage people to take a look at some of the presentations. They're all there. They're quite good. None of them are really short. They all tend to be about an hour. Um, the president in the very beginning talks about 10.5, which is actually kind of interesting. You get to hear from him and how he's never had hair this long in his entire life, but the pandemic has done it to him. And uh, it's a time well spent, even better spent when you have these files to go along with them. And my thought was that if people needed ideas of what to do, some of these things are worth experimenting. I'll be doing some of these things and trying them out. Maybe we'll bring them to Ed's future CNC. Maybe they are things that allow us to do maybe selling stuff that we hadn't considered before. And uh, again, it's just all there because we have our Makerspace edition. They provided us with the file for free. Uh, we have access to CNCs that we either own or at the shop. And why not just feed ourselves with this information? Anyhow, uh, unless Ed, there was something else you wanted me to talk about on that, that's where I wanted to go. No, I appreciate that, Travis, and uh, thank you for doing that. And also, uh, I think that brings our meeting to an end. So what I will do is I will close out this recording, and then I will make sure to get this up in the next day or two. Hey, so Ed, thank you all. Ed, Ed yes. this is Lou Adzema. Yes, Lou. Hey, uh, oh, I wish you'd I wish you'd cut it off earlier, Ed. <laughs> I can stop the recording. <laughs> Go, Lou, go. Uh, Howard mentioned uh, you know, magnet uh, tool bits, and they will give San Diego Fine Woodworkers a 10% discount on their bits if you order online, or I mean, on, on <laughs> if you call them phone? and do yeah. it as voice uh, order, uh, just tell them you're with San Diego Fine Woodworkers, and they'll give you. 10% discount. And, and Lou, who was the fine soul that negotiated that benefit to our membership? I have a picture of him. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a self-portrait, Lou? <laughs> no, actually, hey, and I, 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 uh, I've ordered quite a bit from him. And uh, like Howard was saying, Legacy worked really close with them. So they're yeah. the ones that with all the turning router bits and things that uh, Tracy Anderson has wanted to make for turning, uh, that's who made them was that, uh, and it's a family owned organization too. Okay. But I, I, I agree, a man of tools are great. I have a lot of them, a very expensive ones that I don't want to talk about, uh, <laughs> but they're great tools too. But uh, that's just a tip for everybody. If you want to get something from Magnet, they have a full selection of quarter inch and half inch bits. Okay, hey, thank you, Lou. And I know you're gonna end the recording or you have ended the recording, but before everybody drops off, I'd just be curious to hear what's up with anybody. I mean, we didn't really get a chance to do